afternoon, everyone. I'm Marcy, one of the librarians with the Santa Clara County Library District. And welcome to Home for the Holidays, preparing side dishes. I wanna go over a couple things with you, just so you know. We're recording the session today, um, but your video will not appear and you've been muted. And our chat feature is not available, but you can ask your questions through the Q&A button. And then at times when there's good time for us to stop and take some questions, I'll read your questions to Laura and she'll answer them. And at the end, we'll go through and have a couple more questions, uh, if you have any more questions at the end. In your email with the Zoom link, there was an attachment with all today's recipes that Laura's making, plus extra recipes and information. So uh, make sure you see that. And um, we will be posting this video on SCC LD YouTube channel in a couple of days. So if you want to watch this video again, you have that opportunity and I'll send you the link as well. Last month, Chef Laura did another program for us from farm to fork fall cooking. And that also is available on the YouTube channel. Let's get started with today's program with Chef Laura Streck. And welcome, Laura. Hey, Santa Clara Library and everybody else out there. Do we know who the farther? We don't know where people are from. Like, is anyone from out of state? We don't know that, do we? No, not yet. So we don't know if my mom's on the Zoom. OK, well. Uh, Anyways, happy holidays to everybody. Whatever you celebrate, tis the season. It's wonderful to be back. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Portola Valley, California. We're uh, broadcasting live from my kitchen. Uh, this is called Kitchen TV. We like to stir things up. Um, we're doing a class today on uh, holidays, and we've got three recipes for you and an extra one. We're going to do a side dish of wild rice, chestnut, and kabocha squash. Um, we'll do a shaved salad, and then we will do green beans uh, with candied um, shallots. So um, what I wanted, I wanted to start off by just saying that cooking and eating take two different sides of the brain. Now, that's not a scientific study. That's Laura Stack after 20 plus years of cooking, realizing that, you know, sometimes it's very hard to put a party on just because. People want to talk to you and you don't want to talk because you're cooking. So um, if that's your story, um, I encourage you, one, to turn on the music uh, so that you don't feel like you always have to be hosting these people while you are um, cooking. And the other thing is to get them to help. Uh, because really, um, if you find yourself stressed because of that idea that it's just hard to kind of do both those things at the same time, you are not alone. And, um, you know, fill yourself, give, give your guests something to do, uh, help them out, have you help them out, help have them help you out, and then turn on some music. Um, I think that's a really good, on so many parties I go to, people don't have any music on, and it's just awkward until other people start to arrive and the energy starts to fill. So uh, we are going to be cooking through recipes. Um, if you're cooking along and you find that it's going a little too fast, then just focus on one recipe. The video will be there. You can obviously return to that. Um, we're going to do uh, no animals today, I think. I don't even know if we have any dairy in the class. I actually don't even know this may be a complete vegan class. Uh, plant forward is the trend. I encourage you and me to learn more about eating more plants and vegetables. Those are the things we really have to study on how to incorporate into our diet easily. Um, if I mention cl um, other classes during class, that's because there are other classes I teach. And if you find one that you think just sounds interesting, you know, talk to the library. Maybe they can bring me back in again. Uh, questions are good. If I can answer them during class, I will. If not, we'll answer them at the end of class. Good questions are, I have allergies to this. Um, I don't like that. What are my substitutions? And as always, I like feedback. So you've got my contact information. Feel free to send me an email if you choose. All right. So we're going to start off with the wild rice. Um, I've already cooked my rice, uh, but I wanted to just uh, get the overhead shot and show you that all wild rice is not equal. 
So if you can see from the overhead shot here, the, uh, the type of rice I've got, I got this from Rainbow Grocery, which is in um, San Francisco. And uh, you know, so much of the food they give us in our grocery store is just so highly processed no matter what it is, vegetable, animal, that um, it's really good to go to higher quality stores and pay a little bit more. And so this is beautiful wild rice. Um, it's a lot longer than what's normal. Uh, do, are, do I have a spotlight on the overhead shot? Can I, is that, is that, am I just not seeing it? Yes, we are doing the overhead shot. Okay, good, because I'm not seeing it. No worries. Anyways, um, the recipe says a cup. Uh, I actually am doing a little bit more because I'm going to a party tonight. And uh, so we'll just demo how we uh, cook the wild rice. It's very simple. Uh, once you have that better quality, uh, of course, wild rice is not a grain. It is a grass. Wild rice is not a grain, it's a grass. And we can just take the rice and cover it with water and add some salt to our water, a good pinch of salt, you know, maybe at least I would say half teaspoon, if not more. And then we'll just put that on the back burner and let that cook up. And once it comes up to uh, cooking, it's going to go for about 45 minutes. In fact, I'm going to move the rice over to the other side. All right. Next, we're going to work on our shallots. Uh, shallots, of course, are onions with a college education, right? They have a more developed flavor. And um, we're going to use them in two dishes today, just because a lot of times we don't use these other onion allium type produce. Shallots and leeks today will be, we'll be focusing on them. Um, we're going to use the candied shallots for the green beans. It's a wonderful dish. I use it all the time for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. It's kind of my favorite side dish. Um, I peeled my shallots already. And I just want to say that a lot of shallots these days are really very big. Shallots used to be small, which is why the recipe says 20. But you know, shallots these days are very large. So 10 shallots to a pound of green beans, if they're large, cut in half is really a good way to go. And I would say something like this, which, you know, here's the size of a walnut and here's the size of a shallot. This one's actually relatively large. So I like to look for the small shallots. And if I end up having to take large shallots, I'll just cut them in half. And then I'm gonna go over to my stove and I'll take the stove shot. And I'm going to use a not non-stick skillet. So I want things to stick to this. If anyone has been in my classes before, we know that vegetables have secrets. And the secret is that they're sweet. And the sweetness comes out during caramelization. Caramelization happens to vegetables or fruits, carbohydrates. And it's when all vegetables are carbohydrates, including onions, all vegetables can, can caramelize. But it requires a temperature of 330 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. So are you smarter than a fifth grader? What temperature does water boil at? Think about that for a minute. All right, I'm gonna add some uh, sauteing oil, extra, uh, extra virgin olive oil is uh, fine to saute with. It has a smoke point of 375 to 425. You don't wanna saute with a unfiltered olive oil, which can be uh, lower the smoke point. And I'm gonna add my shallots into my not nonstick pan. And in order to get the best possibility of shallot, hold on, I gotta do something here, everybody. I've got a, I've got a burner that's not on correctly. Let me turn my burner. There we go, turn it back up. So in order to get the best caramelization, it's the place where the vegetable touches the pan. And so I want to, any vegetables that might be off to the um, like uh, are are more um, on the roly poly side. I want to flip those guys over to get the best caramelization and let that be done. And so the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to prime these shallots. 
with caramelization. And then they're going to finish caramelizing in the um, oven. And this process, if you really slow down the cooking of onions, whether it be regular onions on the stovetop or slower in the oven, if you slow down that cook time, the compounds in the onion will become more and more and more complex. So the reason why these shallots are called candied shallots is because, not because they have any sugar added to them, it's just the amount of time they cook allows for that rich flavor. And there is nothing like it. If you like onions, this is your dish. It's very simple. And you can make these shallots the day before and then just heat them up right before dinner. So fantastic side dish. And we'll let those do some caramelization. All right. So while that's going on, we're going to move on now to our kabocha. And, you know, I love winter squash. This kabocha, it looks like a, a pumpkin. It's, it's orange on the inside, but green on the outside. Uh, kabocha squashes are reported to be the least, the, the most sweet squash. So they're fantastic. I think much better than, certainly than acorn, definitely better than butternut. And the flavor is just so delicious that I encourage you to um, consider using them. Another great thing about a kabocha squash is that you can actually eat the skin. And um, you don't have to, we might take it off today, but um, it just saves time if you don't have to take off the skin. So that's fantastic. Like with any squash, what we want to do is cut it in half. That's where actually those um, cleavers, this is the fun, this, this is Laura's uh, favorite things, right? For Christmas, uh, a cleaver is a fun gift. You don't use it that often, but you can absolutely take it. And it's fun to kind of, this is exactly what you need it for are these, um, are these uh, big pieces of vegetables and chicken bones. And you can just play with it. Like, you know, pretend that you're some, try to get to the center of the squash and huh, let's see how well you do just using a cleaver. They're fantastic tools. I'm gonna look at my, I'm gonna look at my, uh, let's give me the overhead shot. I'm gonna look at my onions. They're doing good. They're nice and caramelized. And so I'll just turn over the bottom. All I wanna do is really brown them and start my process. All right. So again, with the squash, I'll take out the seeds. These seeds are perfectly able, in fact, even better than pumpkin seeds to roast. So if you feel like cleaning the seeds with water and getting off the pulp, it is absolutely um, a wonderful, and I think even better seed than you would find in a pumpkin. Now in order to take uh, skin off a of squash, I would usually just lay it down on the cutting board and cut down using the squash itself against the cutting board to give me some kind of solid thing to go against. But again, you don't have to take off the skin. So if you would like to leave the skin on or take some of the skin off and some of the skin on, that's fantastic. And what I'm gonna do is cut the squash and just roast it. And while I'm doing this, cutting it up into bite-sized pieces, I wanna say that I love winter squash and I love the fact that um, I love using the flavors of the season in dishes. But I think what people do with winter squash is all wrong. I, I only see people either have that mashed up squash dish or sweet potato dish with added sugar in it or honey or whatever, marshmallows in a casserole, which I can't stand. Um, or they have big piles of only winter squash cubed that are dry. And I actually think winter squash isn't a dish to stand on its own very much. I think it, winter squash is fantastic, but we want to use it with other things. Uh, we want to put it in salads. We want to put it in soups. We want to put it in a grain dish. So a whole dish of winter squash is just too much. And so this is a good way to exemplify having one of these winter squashes roast some to add into soups or add into salads and add into grain dishes and then put some in a soup 
Um, it, or, or, you know, another thing with extra roasted squash, put it on your oatmeal in the morning. All right, so I'm just gonna cut it into small pieces. And of course I wanna have similar size pieces, why? Because they cook at a similar time. And then I'll just take the squash, put it in a bowl. I don't have the amount of olive oil because it's really more, more by feel. Uh, I think you just want to sprinkle in some olive oil so that it coats it, but you don't want it drowning in oil, right? And then we'll put it out on a saute pan. And what you want to make sure when you're roasting your squash is that you don't leave squash like in a pile. Same thing in the pan that you want to flatten it all out so that the vegetable touches the pan, whether it be the, the uh, shallots or whether it be um, squash, because that's the way that you're going to get caramelization. And then into a 375 degree oven, and it's actually going to be more like 350 because I'm going to add my shallots in two. I'm going to take some uh, aluminum foil and I'm going to cover that squash loosely and put it in the oven. Now, I think one of the tricks toward having moist squash is to put that aluminum foil over it. Because usually what happens is the squash dries out by the time that it's done. So it's this balance between moisture and caramelization, between being cooked and being burnt that we try to achieve in cooking. And if you just put a squash, you know, cut squash in the oven without something on top of it, um, and it doesn't have to be a pretty, I say leftover piece of foil, and you can place them together, but it just helps keep that moisture in. All right, so we're going to go back to our onions now uh, that have nice caramelization. Why don't we go very good? We can leave it on the stove shot. And when they have nice caramelization, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add some stock to it. And I can add chicken stock, I can add vegetable stock, whatever homemade stock I have, whatever you choose. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change my pan to a smaller pan that will combine or hold the stock closer to um, the onions. And also because I have a small stove and I'm baking a couple things today. And you don't have to heat it or anything. Basically cover your shallots. So how many ever you have and always make more for this dish because people love them. And kind of cover them and then we're just going to throw those in the oven as well. Now if you have a lot of time, a 325 degree oven is actually better because it allows for that time and the ability for those onions to cook longer. But if you if you're kind of neat, like if you've got a couple things in your oven like I do, then you can, you know, 350 is fine. You just have to pay a little bit more attention. We're going to keep adding stock throughout the hour and let that stock reduce and um, uh, uh, candy our shallots. All right, so uh, now we're gonna move on to our beans. And of course the shallots are going to go over our beans. And our green beans, there's a, take the overhead shot, there's a mis uh, you know, Misunderstanding, a lot of people take both sides of the bean off, right? You don't have to take this part of the bean off. There's no reason to remove that if we're talking about saving time. Um, so just this harder part needs to come off, right? Don't worry about that little, the little knobby in the front. I'm gonna blanch those beans. And this is a step that you can also even do the day before if you choose. So um, I've just got a pot of some water here. I could add a little salt to it. Certainly you can do this hours before your guests come, uh, which is really the way to kind of get, get the whole bean dish ready. And then all you need to do is heat it up at the end and that's what we'll do too. So we'll just bring our water to a boil and let those beans get ready. 
So our green beans with shallots, the shallots are cooking and then they're gonna cook all through the class. And at the end of class, they probably could use a little bit more time, but we'll uh, take them out of the oven and they're gonna go atop our beans. And uh, now we're all we're gonna go back to work on our rice dish. So our rice, by the miracles of a cooking class, after it's cooked, it's gonna come out from, let's, let's, uh, let's, let me do this. Let's say after your rice is cooked, what you wanna do is make sure that the moisture releases. So how do I do that? Once my rice is cooked, it'll take me about 45 minutes and keep it on a low boil, not a real hot, strong boil and add more water if you need to. And then say the rice was cooked and I'll pour it out and make sure that it strains well. And then what I wanna do is take that rice and spread it out on a baking sheet. Why? Why do I wanna spread my rice out on a baking sheet? Because the moisture in the rice will keep cooking the rice. And it may not overcook the rice, but what it makes it is gummy. So pretty much for things that you're doing when you're cooking whole grains, you want to take those grains out of whatever it is and give them the opportunity to let the steam off. And that's what we'll do with our rice so that it does not become gummy. <laughs> Okay, so to our rice, we're gonna add a few accoutrements. And we're gonna start off with our leeks and our shallots. So leeks are buttery. Um, shallots are onions with a college education. If I didn't wanna use either, I could use about approximately a cup of chopped fresh onions, uh, yellow, red, whatever I choose. But if I want to introduce some new flavors and some different kinds of experience of onion, shallots and leeks are great options. Um, make sure if you're doing a dish that has different, you know, a lot of onions in it, say you have three dishes with onions, don't have onions, yellow onions in all of them. Make sure you change it up. Either red onions um, or white onions or preferably move into, you know, chives and green onions and leeks and shallots. Because it just what that you know everything with yellow onions in it isn't good, and usually at like a Thanksgiving or a Christmas deal, dinner we have a lot of onions in the food. The green part, of course, is composted, and I'll take the bottom part of the leek off. And to make my life a lot easier, because this leek is kind of big, I'm going to cut it in half, and then cut it in half again. So this part goes into the compost. And then leeks are tricky. They're not as bad as they used to be. Um, of course, that means that they're probably more just processed, which is unfortunate with our food system. But leeks just have a lot of um, you know, dirt that would hide out in, the, in these layers between, between the, uh, the leek. And so you just wanna take it and soak it for a little bit. If you let the leek soak in water for about five minutes, the leaves will open up and then you can see the dirt more if you've got places that it's hard. So we'll just let that soak for a bit. For the shallots, we get into shallots just like we would get into an onion. Uh, where we cut an onion, or we cut a shallot just like we would cut an onion if we are interested in dicing them. So I'm gonna take this um, shallot and I'm gonna cut it in half and do just like we do uh, for an onion, if you're taking a cooking class from me, I'll take my knife and I'll cut through horizontally, but not all the way. I want something to keep the onion in back, the shell in back. And then I'll change the position of my knife vertically so that you have what you're left with is a checkerboard. And even a small little shallot I can do that. And then I can just take my knife and go straight down. And when I get to the point where 
The back part was not chopped. I'll just cut it into um, planks and then I'll turn that into a dice. So again, I'll just take my shallot, depending how big it is, I might have to put a few slices into the shallot if it's thicker. And then I can determine how big of a dice I want by how many slices I put into the onion. So the nice thing about this, this type of process with cutting shallots or onions is that it prevents you from mm, manhandling the shallot. It, shallots, onions, they have acids that when we touch them, cut them, fly up in the air and land in our eyes, and then we start to cry. So the less we touch our shallot, the better off our eyes will be. All right. So I'm going to move these shallots from my cutting board to my bowl. Do I use the front of my knife to move them? Do I move them like this? Or do I use the back of my knife to move things from my cutting board to somewhere else? What do I use? The knife. I use the back of the knife to move things from my cutting board. Why? I want to dull my knife. I don't want to scrape my cutting board. All right, go to the stove shot. Actually, I'm going to change here. I'm going to put the beans in the back. I'm going to put, I've got about three tablespoons of butter in here. The recipe says two, but I'm adding a little bit more to our um, dish because again, I'm making some uh, rice. I'm making about a, a cup and a half of rice as compared to one. I'm just going to add those shallots in there. I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil, saute olive oil, can be extra virgin, about a tablespoon or so. Again, extra virgin olive oil has a smoke point of 375 to 425. So you can saute with it. You just don't want to do really high heat searing. I say anything under 400 degrees is safe for extra virgin olive oil. All right, I've got my leeks. It hasn't quite been five minutes, but my leeks are clean. So that's uh, good. They didn't have a lot of dirt, but this is a good time. And of course, it doesn't matter if the if the um, leaves separate because actually it's good if the leaves separate. And then we're just going to chop these guys up. Now this is a good time to consider how do we hold our knife when we're chopping, or how do we hold our knife, and how do we hold our hands. And you may notice, oh, what how pretty, look at how the sun's coming through on that. Isn't that lovely? You may notice that what you're going to see from me as I'm chopping is I'm not gonna have my fingers out like this, right? Ow! And I'm not gonna have my thumb sticking out here. Ow! I wanna bend my fingers, put my thumb behind my fingers, and then this part of my hand becomes the block so that I don't cut myself, right? So watch that as I these guys up, turn it to low, because I'm still gonna add. So again, when I cut these in half, and I'm not like this, and I'm not like this, I'm like this. And then that allows me to be able to, basically I could look up if I want to, but I don't want to look up because I've got different layers of leaks moving all around here. So I want to be careful with that. And basically the, the, the goal is to have about a cup of leeks and shallots for about a cup of wild rice, but of course you can do whatever you choose. So that's about a little bit more than I would say about a cup and a half, that's where I'm going for. Certainly I could add more, but I'm just gonna let that cook. And what we're doing often with onions, we're doing the same kind of thing actually. We've got a, we've got a double lesson here and it's good for us to remember twice. Um, I want to slow and slow when it comes to onions. I want to bring the temperature up so that it gets hot. 
And then I want to reduce the temperature so that my onions, my shallots, my leeks have enough time to create that complexity. So that is, um, if you feel, if you find that it's, you know, your onions are getting just too hot and they're getting rough and, you know, just turn down the temperature is what you're going for. Oops, okay. All right, so to that, we're gonna add our celery. You wanna clean off your cutting board first. The vegetables, one of my teachers used to say, the vegetables like their space, so you don't want to, have a messy cutting board. It's kind of like a messy desk. And you wanna make sure that your vegetables have space and that they have the respect that they are due. And uh, now we're gonna add some celery. So celery has strings that get cut my teeth. Uh, nah, nah, rah, 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 rah. Right, I wanna clean up those strings by taking the, why don't we get the overhead shot? I'll take the back of the celery and the front of the knife and I'm just gonna hit that, there we go. I'm just gonna hit that celery very easily at the top. And then I can pull off those strings. Now I don't have to do that, right? But the strings get in the way. You wanna compost the strings and then you can come back and do the same thing. Pull those strings off. It doesn't have to be, you know, all, all over the place. You can, again, back of the knife, Back of the celery, front of the knife, pull it down. If you didn't have too much success with that, then you can take the knife again and pull down a little bit. This is something my mom taught me years ago. A lot of people don't do this. And again, it just makes the celery more accessible to your teeth. You don't really want things that get stuck in people's teeth. So that would be something like, uh, celery strings or kale stems. You know, those things get stuck in people's teeth. Now, if you don't mind that, that's okay. But when you're cooking for other people, definitely want to watch out about that. All right, and this is the kind of the same thing. We get to show how we want to hold our knife. I'm going to cut these guys in half. I'm going to use that same technique with my hand over. All I want to do with celery, actually, um, unless you have a lot of time, you know, celery really does need its time too. Celery is, um, in a dish, you often find that celery hasn't been cooked as much as you would like. So given it's due, celery really can be added pretty much at the same time as onions. Um, celery has a lot of moisture, so it actually can saute a lot longer than a lot of other vegetables. Um, that's one of the key things, like what do you add with onions? Well, you add foods that are, um, you know, that take a little bit of longer time to cook. So the mirepoix, the carrot, onion, celery is a very common connection. But the thing about celery is because of its moisture, it can actually take that longer, slower process. And it, it, that's good. Unlike garlic, that has no moisture. So don't add garlic with onions. It usually burns by the time the onions are done. All right, I got my water blanching. I'm gonna add my beans. I just left them whole. Are we on the stove shop? Oh gosh, Marcy, you were on top of it. Right, everybody wants to make sure they've got some kind of good strainer in their kitchen. So something, you know, something like, uh, you know, Invest in some good products. If you don't have products that you like, chances are you won't cook as much. If you like the things you have in your kitchen, chances are you will use them. So the recipe says a few minutes on both, I think the celery and the onions, but I wanna change that. If you are looking at your recipe, I really think giving it you know, approximately about 10 minutes at least at a temperature that is slow enough that it can continue to, um, to cook is a good way to do that. All right. And then we're gonna get our, our herbs ready. We just have whatever, you know, we have parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme for you today. And let's look a little bit about um, how to get into herbs. Most people don't use herbs because they just have, they take extra time. So we'll take the overhead shot to do, to do a couple things, to teach you a couple things about stripping. Stripping is one of the uh, techniques we use, especially with thyme. 
you just take uh, from the top of the time, hold on to it, and then you can just pull down and you get, and then you can just pop the top off because usually the top is, um, is not as um, woody as the rest. So again, I've got here with like a number of straight, a number of, uh, you know, uh, what would it call branches on it. You can still do the same thing so that I end up with nothing at the top and you can basically go as far as you want and then just pop the top off. So, oh, this smells so good. Oh my God, it smells great. So this doesn't take long, does it? You know, fast, fast, fast. Um, when it comes to sage, I usually just, unless they're really big leaves, I'll just pop off sage leaves like I would cilantro. I'll save this, um, make a tea out of it, which is brew, add a little, steep your stems, take all these, steep them, add a little maple syrup to it. Oh my God, you got what they call witch's brew. It's such a great herbal flavor. So you can definitely use that. And then for the rosemary, same thing. Uh, for the rosemary, uh, stripping is kind of the option. If you have a stem that's strong enough to take stripping, that's the way to go because it's extremely fast. So none of this, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. Forget about it. Forget about it, just strip it. Just strip, right? No, anyways, okay. So we've got our herbs. Maybe I could use a few more in there. Okay, so we've got a lot of things going on right now, don't we? What do we got? We got our onions in the oven. We're gonna check those because we wanna add stock as they, um, as the stock evaporates. Um, we have our celery and our onions sauteing back here, doing a nice slow celery. And if you just look, or maybe you'll spotlight the camera, Marcy, you know, it's, it's cooking, but it's not too quick. And it actually doesn't even have a lot of that brown fond on the bottom yet because the temperature is lower. And that's okay. We don't need it to be cooking that fast. We have our beans blanching and beans, you know, depending, they usually take about, I don't know, you know, I'd go about five, you know, beans are different sizes. So skinny and thick take longer, but you know, anywhere from five to usually eight minutes, you're going to get a blanched green bean. And um, yeah, so that's, let's look, let, why do, uh, while we're taking that break and kind of checking in to see all the things we got going on, let's look at our onions. All right. Ooh, that guy doesn't work very well. I just brought out the Christmas, uh, the Christmas handle, and that just doesn't work. So I'm, we, I'm sure we're gonna still need. Yeah. So we've still got a lot. What are we on the uh, stove shot? We've still got a lot of um, moisture in our onions, and so we, you know, we definitely want those guys to uh, come down and be a lot more caramelized, and the sauce becomes sticky. All right, so let's look at our beans. Down the stove shot, if you will. Oh no, probably not ready, but the way that we do a bean is we'll take it out, there you go. And if the bean will crack, it's ready. So these aren't ready because you want it to break in half. Uh, it's getting pretty close, very close. If it bends, it's not ready. You want it to break in half. Okay. And that's good. So we'll let that go for a little bit longer. All right. Now we're going to move on to our salad. So our salad is a unique salad in that it uses the fall vegetables, the root vegetables, the celery root, the, um, the uh, winter squash, um, fennel, carrot, um, in a unique way of presenting so that we experience a winter squash or a celery root without even cutting, without even cooking it. And I love that idea. I love the idea because one, whoever thought that we could have squash without um, cooking it, um, but also um, the technique of, or the, the, the cut we get from simply shaving a vegetable is unique in itself. And, 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 and a technique that is good to use in any kind of salad that you may use because variation in cooking causes us to eat more. Variation causes us to eat more. 
The junk food industry knows this. That's why there are 15 flavors of Doritos, right? We eat one and then we realize nacho cheese is a rant, cool ranch, so I want the cool ranch and the nacho. And basically I'm just entertaining my brain with different flavors. Well, we can do that in cooking. We can make different flavors, but we also get variation from texture and from the way that vegetables and things are presented to us, the way that they are cut. And to shave a vegetable is unique uh, for most households. So we're gonna do that. Uh, first, I wanna get these beans out. I know that they're ready to go because they were pretty close. So I'm just gonna drain the beans. And we'll let those drain in back. Our onions are looking fantastic. Oh, look, and we're getting some fond. And of course, are we, are we on the stove shop? Yeah. We're starting to get some fond. And when we get fond or that brown stuff that sticks, we want to deglaze our pan or pick that fond up by adding a little bit of liquid. It could be stock, it could be wine, it could be the uh, drink you're drinking, it could be apple juice. And I just want to add a little bit of stock and a flat wooden spoon, a flat wooden spoon is better than a round wooden spoon, right? This guy for picking up stuff. This guy is better than this. I'm better than you. I'm better than, why are you better than me? I'm better than you because I can pick up. I, the flat will give me more you know, a connection to the pan. So flat wooden spoon, and here's another one of Laura's favorite 10 things, right? What a great gift. Smiley spoons, you can get them online. Fantastic. Keep that on the stove shot because what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get our beans, I'm gonna transfer our beans just to a pan in preparation for our guests. All right, I'm gonna leave them back there. All right, so, uh, before I go up and finish with the salad though, we're gonna just add a few chestnuts to our saute. And chestnuts, again, the flavors of the season. It's so wonderful to eat the flavors of the season. We wanna eat more of them when we can. Chestnuts, of course, if you've ever roasted them yourself, often they just get dry. Um, these happen to be canned or just I mean, they're jarred. So they're already done, I don't have to do them. And they're boiled. And I really enjoy jarred chestnuts. One, because I just don't have to do them myself. And two, because they actually store very well. So, um, I, you know, a boil, a, a jarred chestnuts, fantastic flavor, more moisture than you would get from usually your own. I'm gonna just cut those guys in half or in a quarter. And I'm going to add about a half a cup of chestnuts to my saute. And I'm gonna add in those herbs that I um, that we prepared. I'm gonna add in my sage. I'm gonna add my rosemary and my thyme. And we're just gonna let that mix. I may add a little bit more olive oil to this just because basically I'm making a nice saute that's gonna go into my cooked um, rice along with my squash. Oh, and how about that squash? It's baking in the oven. So let's look at our squash for a second. Now I pre-baked the squash because of course we're doing a lot of things. But just say that squash we put in the oven earlier came out and looked like this. And I do, I do want the stove shot, or excuse me, I do want yeah, the, the overhead shot. Because I want you to see that the squash, while it's cooked, and I, you know, I lift it off about a half an hour later, I lift it off the, um, the aluminum foil. And I just take a, a fork and I go to the biggest pieces and I make sure that the fork will enter the squash, right? But if you look at this picture, the squash has very little caramelization to it. So what I like to do, because vegetables have secrets, the secret is that they're sweet, is I want to remove my aluminum foil after the squash is cooked and I'll put it back in the oven to give it a little bit more caramelization. So depending on the oven and the, whatever the size of the squash, maybe about five minutes is usually what it needs. But it will take the moisture that's left that made your squash moist, which is of course what we're looking for, and then it will um, caramelize it or it will let those um, carbohydrates uh, brown, which is what we're looking for. 
Okay, so my shape fall salad, I'm gonna cut into my butternut squash. I did wash the squash. And the thing about this dish is you really want fresh produce. So this isn't the kind of dish I think that you go to, you know, Safeway and you buy, um, you know, the butternut squash. Um, and it's definitely not the celery root because anytime you order, you do things like with rutabagas, parsnips, celery root, you want um, the freshest uh, produce. And a lot of times that those types of vegetables that don't get a lot of turnover are not the best at, at grocery stores like that. So um, definitely either a produce market or the farmer's market is best for something like a shaved salad that you're not gonna be cooking especially. Um, and then I want you to just take your, you know, you can take a mandolin or you can take a, um, a peeler if you don't have a mandolin. A mandolin, of course, is a like a big peeler. This is a mandolin, and that works well for shaving, right? Much better than a peeler. But a peeler works fine too. No matter which one you use, I want you to remember. I'm gonna peel off the skin on my carrot. I want you to remember that different peelers have different thicknesses. So um, I think with a shaved salad, you don't want the peeler that is too thick. The idea is that you're having really thin pieces uh, because that will be much better. And these type of, now I'm just we're doing a carrot into my salad. But these, you know, carrot curls are fantastic to add to any kind of salad. So I would, I encourage you to do that. We're going to add a little bit of fennel to it. Fennel is one of those things a lot of times we're like, what do I do? What do I use fennel? You know, how do I use it? And, you know, a little bit of fennel goes a long way, but it also, um, it shaves very nicely as you see. And I think fennel, is really good in salads, um, not a lot, but you know, just a little bit, because it um, it has such a unique flavor. But the flavor can overpower, especially if people aren't used to it. So, uh, ooh, what a smell! And then for the celery root, for the celery root, which is this weird root that you often have a hard time knowing what to do with it, you know, basically you do want to take off kind of like a stop, um, like a squash. You can use your knife and the side of the squash, the side of the vegetable itself to be the, the break to give you something to hold, uh, to, you know, the force against the, uh, the vegetable. And then same thing. And then definitely for celery root, Celeriac or celeriac, uh, who, who knows how to say that? I, same thing, you want it fresh. If you don't have it fresh, leave it out of the recipe. All right. Do we have the over, oh no, you have me. It's just a beautiful, fun. And then to that, I'm gonna add a little bit of red onion, raw red onion. And anytime you have red onion and you're adding it raw, remember that a lot of people don't like red onion. I mean, people don't like onion raw. So make sure it's skinny. Thin is what you're looking for. And then for these, for I think for these guys, I'm just gonna slice them up a little bit so that they're not so, so thick. Okay. I'm gonna make a quick salad dressing to go on top of that. And of course, when we're talking about salad dressings, that introduces us again to things we can use for Christmas gifts. One is good quality olive oil. Um, another one is some flake salt that we'll use at the end of everything. And uh, when you are shopping for gifts, you know, I love that sweater and those earrings were okay too, but they, at this age, please don't give me, give me something I could use. And something I can use is culinary gifts and a good quality olive oil or some flake salt um, or wonderful or wonderful ingredients. So what do we got? We're gonna add a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar to our salad dressing. 
I'm going to add a tablespoon of white balsamic vinegar, which is also a wonderful holiday gift, white balsamic vinegar. Why might this be better at times than a dark balsamic vinegar? Because of the color. If you want something that's not going to mess up the color of your beautiful salad, uh, definitely a little bit of white vinegar is better than the dark. Right, I'm going to add about a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And Dijon uh, gives us the emulsifying ability for the oil to stick to the vinegar. So oil and vinegar don't match, and it's the Dijon that brings it all together. I'll talk about that more when I add it. Um, apple cider, I love in this dressing. It's perfect for the salad. We don't have much in the West, um, and we can't get it fresh like in the East. If there's anybody back East, you know the fresh apple cider is so good. So I'm starting to use hard cider, actually. Um, uh, just a hard, dry cider. The cider, of course, would be the sweet and the dressing, but this I don't think is going to be that sweet. Let's taste it. I mean, yeah, not bad. And that's a hard cider. I'm just going to add a few tablespoons to that. And then I'm going to whisk those guys up. I'm going to work really quickly in my oven to see if, how my squash is doing. It's doing all right. I'll add my salt in now. I'm going to add some white pepper, another great holiday gift. Get a white, get white pepper. For the cook who has everything, they probably don't have a white pepper grinder. These fun little grinders I get at Crate and Barrel. And then we're going to add in our oil. So I've got a good quality oil that I bought from a farmer's market. I won't be sauteing with it because then I would saute out my flavor. Plus it's unfiltered, which gives it better flavor, but lowers its smoke point which is why I use it for salad dressings. And then I'll add it slowly and whisk while I'm doing that, about six tablespoons. Why do I add it slowly and then whisk? Why don't I add it all together or what's the science behind it? Oil and vinegar don't match. They don't mix. So the Dijon, what we want to do is the Dijon will coat the olive oil molecules so that it will stick with the vinegar. And if I do that process slowly, I'll have better emulsification. Mm. Yum, needs a little bit more vinegar, a little bit more vinegar. So I'm going to add a little bit more salt and a little bit more apple cider vinegar. And any time that you are making something like that, anything, taste it and see if you can taste everything you added. And if you can't, you know, go through the recipe. Do, can I taste apple cider vinegar? Can I taste the white balsamic vinegar, right? Run through the list. Don't just say good or bad. See if you can taste everything. Mm. Yeah, really nice balance. Okay, so that's my salad dressing. I'm just gonna toss it onto my salad. I can let that sit. Actually, it's nice and fine to let it marinate. I'm gonna take my squash out of the oven, I think, would be the first next thing I wanna do. Let me get, because it should have a little bit of caramelization on it. I don't wanna have it too much. Let me see. Oh yeah. Okay, this stupid thing doesn't work very well. Here we go. Oh yeah, so what, what's, what do what, you, you, you got? Yeah. So we're starting to get some caramelization and I'm actually gonna leave it in a little bit longer. Let's see how we do it. Now for the beans. Okay, so it's almost time. Oh my God, the best are coming in four minutes. The beans are fantastic because they were blanched. And now all I wanna do is a quick mix of some mustard, Dijon green beans. So just mustard, maybe a table, you know, it depends on how many beans you have, what do I say? Or the dish, I say. Two tablespoons, one tablespoon of Dijon, and then two tablespoons of butter or olive oil. Uh, because you're not really cooking the olive oil, you can do the good olive oil, you can do melted butter. And if you want to take that sauce a little bit farther, you can add a little stock to it. I don't have that in the in the list. So that means that this is all ready to go too. Mix it well. 
And then I'll just turn my green beans on in the back and get them heating. And because there's no acid in here, I'm not adding any wine or vinegar. I can just add them to my beans as um, if you can give me the back shot. That'll get those guys. That gives them a nice sauce to heat up with and give some flavor to. And of course, it all can be done beforehand. Now let's take our wild rice. Our rice, of course, can be made beforehand, right? And of course, the, the whole dish can be made beforehand. And then I'll add this guy. And of course, if I just want to reheat my wild rice, I can do that um, in the pan. I can just add it to the pan and heat it. Or I can mix everything up at the same time and uh, put it in the oven to reheat it. My squash. Take out. If we've got the overhead shot, which I can't see, you'll see some of the caramelization. So that's fantastic. Here's caramelization. We can see it pretty on that, how it turns on the brown on the bottom. Whoops, wrong way. Hold on, I can never find the camera. There we go. Good color. We'll add that to our rice. Our beans are hot. And again, what we do here is we have roasted squash, but we don't have it insulting you by having too much of it in, um, you know, in the pan. I, I just, I, people serve these bowls of squash and I, I just don't think it's the way, you know, the way to serve squash. I think it's overkill. We actually don't appreciate it. And I'm gonna add a little bit of arugula to that or parsley. I can chop it. Or not, good. Okay, so why don't we get some plating here? Let's get some plating because it's time, it's almost time to eat. Oh my goodness, all right, what do we have for you? How do we plate it for you? Let's see. Okay, oh wow, that smells so good. Mm. All right, so we're going to taste our squash, excuse me, our winter squash and our and see if we need to add anything to it. Salt, pepper, mm -hmm. good flavor. If you want to brighten it up a little bit, you can add a little bit of um, lemon juice to it and give it a little kick. It's a nice mix of grain and squash and green. It's just a nice mix all together. So we'll look at that up here. And wild rice is something, if you're not cooking it in the season, please do get some wild rice. It's so unique. It's so fall and winter. And it's just a nice, different thing. And of course, this is a grain dish that has a lot more than grain which is good. We all need to eat more whole grains. We learn about that in the grains class. I'll put my beans. Definitely give them a taste, but what an easy, the Dijon and the butter and the stock if you choose, salt and um, Dijon, butter and, uh, and stock allow you to have a sauce that doesn't turn your beans a different color. You know, if you had a, a sauce that um, has an acid in it, it will turn your beans. I have my beautiful shaped salad. Remember when you're plating that height is attractive to the eye. So try to enjoy some height. And don't serve things flat. A lot of times people put things on dishes and they flatten them down. Here I have a few little pomegranates. Of course, another beautiful food of the season. I can add on that. And then maybe a little bit more 
white pepper. And then we'll finish that up with some flake salt. Flake salt is a great um, finisher. Don't crunch it in your hands, let it be flaky. One of the reasons it's so nice is because it gives us texture and salt. You don't have to use a lot of it. And the famous brand is called Maldone. And it's a fantastic uh, thing to give as a holiday gift. And then last, we're gonna look at our shallots, which probably need a little bit more time because again, we didn't uh, give them a full hour even to cook. But let's see what we got. The thing about the shallots is, if you let them cook, and I'll take the stove shot, Marcy, please. I'm having a hard time. I, I, like I said, I brought out my holiday things and yeah, so no, our shallots definitely need some more time. So basically what we have here is our shallots are still too much in liquid. Um, and of course, we, they haven't cooked as long as we want to give them at least an hour in a 350 oven. But what happens is, is the, the, the stock goes down and we may even want to add stock to it. So keep an eye and make sure that the shallots are at least in about a half, halfway in, um, in the moisture, in the stock. And, and let them for at least an hour and then when you get to close to where um, they're, you know, it's been cooking for about an hour, let the stock keep reducing and it turns into this viscous, thick, yummy, um, like candy. So I'm just gonna add them on here, but know that these, when the, when the shallots get there, oh, they, need, they definitely need more time, but when they go, oh my God, they're so beautiful and candy that they just, look great and then you can use the pour whatever kind of a thickened sauce you have on as well all right my dear santa clara library i have for your um i love how the sun comes through here i have for your eating enjoyment we have our wild rice casserole with kabocha arugula chestnut and celery we have our Candy shallots that yes could have used more time. Oh, they're, they're, I'm going to pop them back in the oven. Gorgeous, can be made the, before. And then we have our shayfel salad, which is such a unique again texture. And sometimes texture is something that really um, we want to pay attention to in cooking. And then I had um, one additional recipe for the cranberry sauce. I knew we wouldn't get to it, but I like that recipe because it adds wine to cranberries to, and it allow it cuts down the sugar but it adds to the complexity of the cranberry sauce with the addition of wine. So I, I really love that recipe. I think that cranberry sauce is often too sweet. And when we add so much sweet to kick cranberry, we lose the complexity of the cranberry. So this way we can kind of add like a, a thicker, richer wine, like a Zinfandel, and then reduce the sugar. All right, thank you so much. I think that's Thanks a wonderful Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you, bye.